Today, we're talking to Jake Bajorseth. He is a Gen Z expert, and I want to dig in to what makes Gen Z tick, and more specifically, Gen Z marketing. Because Jake works with some of the largest brands, companies like McDonald's and dozens of others, and he helps them with their social media platforms. So let's dig in and talk to Jake about what makes Gen Z tick and how can we use that for our own marketing. Stick around today on the channel. Let's go. Before we jump into it, make sure that you like this video to encourage this type of content on YouTube and subscribe down below because we do videos three times a week all about business, sales, tech, and everything involved in making sure that your business and agency and B2B company runs effectively. So for you guys, if you're not well versed in who Jake Bajorseth is, he is a Gen Z expert. And actually, Jake, talk about her, uh, your background and some stuff that you're doing with Trendsetters. Yeah, for sure. So I'm the founder here at Trendsetters. We're a Gen Z agency, a solid team of 26 based in here, United States, Los Angeles, Kansas City. Um, and then we have a team in Manila and a couple guys in India as well. So kind of working at that global scale a little bit. And we work with, you know, venture backed startups and a lot of Fortune 1000 brands to ultimately understand and then reach Gen Z. So a lot of insights, consulting strategy, and then, you know, 80% of what we do actually ends up being the execution of that via marketing through the format of media cr content creation, social um, influencer marketing, you name it. Much kind of really in-depth strategies that's very cohesive in terms of like how we go out and reach a mass market Gen Z demographic. Who are some of the, the big clients? Who are some of the impressive people you're working for? Yeah, yeah. So we've had the pleasure of been blessed to work with some incredible brands like McDonald's, United Healthcare, Coke, L'Oreal, Paxson, North Face. I'm sure there's quite a few I'm missing in that kind of upper echelon category. And so, you know, because what we do is so specific and unique to Gen Z, it allows us to get into the doors with some of those larger companies that ultimately they don't have a voice nor anyone in terms of leadership at the table that's actively pushing for an understanding of this entire generation that is not only just a massive consumer market, but we even see with Wall Street bets, like this is even a, a generation that can go impact the financial markets and go screw over a bunch of hedge funds. So I think it's an incredibly powerful generation. And, you know, frankly, organizations today don't have any sort of voice nor understanding beyond, you know, in, interns and entry level employees that simply don't ever get heard. Um, and so we've been able to kind of step in and fill that gap. So what is it? So, OK, you talk about Wall Street bets. I remember when I was first hearing about Wall Street bets in uh, 2020, early 2020, and they had all these things like, you know, they talk about autism, they're talking about all this shit. And I was like, there's no way this is going to hit. There's no way you go mainstream with autistic jokes and all this stuff. And, and guess what? It hit. <laughs> it didn't matter. It didn't matter in the end. Um, what, what have you learned about Gen Z? Because when I'm looking at you, do you do some of the McDonald's Twitter, my favorite Twitter account. We actually did a whole breakdown of the McDonald's Twitter account earlier this week. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I love McDonald's Twitter. I cannot understand a single thing that's going on. I had to learn TikTok just to understand half the half the things you guys are saying. Mm -hmm. So what is it? What what's that key? What how is Gen Z different? What's high level? How is Gen Z different than than the latest generations and the last generations? Yeah, so I would say it's a consumer where what we've seen over the past few decades is that the trust from consumers and brands continues to fade. Uh, brands and corporations, consumers today across all markets, they, they they have less trust in brands. You know that that kind of as a macro trend. And then when we look at Gen Z uh, specifically, this is a generation that has grown up in an era they've only known a digital world that has been advertisements blasted in their face at all times. And so therefore, you have a consumer that advertising and traditional. Uh, methodologies, not even the, not even, oh, you know, it's TikTok is different. No, but the, the traditional methodology of, of pushing a particular product or your, your traditional advertising style, um, that just simply doesn't resonate with this generation. So we have had to get creative in how we engage and work with, and they want to be a consumer set that isn't sold to, they want to purchase, they want to buy, they want to be the decision maker. They want to feel part of a community, which I think that term community is very overused. But I think in a sense, it's making decisions um, that, that go a little bit beyond just the, the transactional decision, but actually uh, being thoughtful in how they make decisions. So, you know, is this a product and brand that is sustainable? Is this one that aligns with my core values and morals? Is this a brand that I can get behind 
Um, or at a very simple level, is this a brand that I just, you know, I fuck with and I enjoy. And and this is something that I find funny mm -hmm. or comical. See, now or, you're talking the right way, dude. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, it's all of that. It, it's the personification of modern day corporate brands um, that for so long have sat behind what we call brand standards, which is frankly just a facade to limit our actual marketing potential to connect and resonate with consumers. And so as that's been broken down, we can now go to the market and connect directly with consumers at a one-to-one -one level, thanks to the power of social media, which we like to call social media, but at the end of the day, this is just the digital infrastructure that we live on. When did that start breaking down? Because I remember I was working with OU, I actually did uh, the social media for Anytizers for Tyson for solid, like seven, eight months. And it was the exact opposite. The whole thing we were doing was like, Anytizers are on sale in this store. Come on down to Costco and get the Anytizers. That was like the whole thing where we would give away a, a grill. It's like the most boring stuff compared to what you guys are doing with McDonald's and, and some of these other brands. So when when did you see that brand guidelines thing break down? Or are our brands, our brands moving away from it? Do you, do you see this trend going in your direction? Yeah, I mean, I would say the, the trend is certainly moving that direction. Now, it's not moving at the speed that it needs to because... The reality is I'm a huge fan of Moore's Law, and, and that's what I believe in, not only in the technology sphere, but I think it also impacts um, at, at a consumer behavior level. Um, if, if you believe in Moore's Law and the acceleration of technology, and with that acceleration of technology, we consume more, we can, we can do much more today in just one day, in 24 hours, than we could 10 years ago, and then much more 10 years before that. And it's not 25, 50% increase. It's a serious multiple. It's exponential. It's three to five to 10 times what was possible, the amount of information and data that, that we're ultimately being hit with. And so that said, consumers, I'm a big believer that consumers are evolving at that same pace. Now, the problem is organizations and brands, while they're certainly moving forward, they're not evolving at that same multiple and frequency that's needed. It's, it's, it's small shifts here and there when we need to be moving much faster overall. So when we do make a shift, we actually go a lot further with that shift. Um, so, you know, when ultimately when I, I, I spotted that, I would say I haven't been in the, the whole marketing world enough to see that. What I have been able to see over the past five years with trendsetters is a, a strong shift from millennials was one of the first cohorts that became like like we talked about it all the time before that we wouldn't loop Gen X or baby boomers into their own categories and demographical and insights data and, and, and overall like marketing categorization just wasn't as popular. It became super popular with millennials, but then we saw how many brands got spurned by that because either they didn't heed the warnings or simply they believed all the headlines when it came to millennials and they didn't actually look into the data and results to actually prove it. Now, Gen Z has become the popular, the next big thing. It's a generation we're all kind of behind. And for those that are in it, they get the sense of pride that they have in that generation. And for older demographics, they see this as an opportunity to recover from the, from the millennial cohort that a lot of these brands missed out on. And this is their chance to win big. So I think brands are starting to move into the space with a little bit greater pace and acceleration. Now, I don't think we're moving as fast as they ultimately need to be moving. Um, but that said, it, it's starting to trend in the right direction. Now, that doesn't mean all the problems are solved. Uh, but I think what we're going to see over the next few years and what we're already starting to see now is, I mean, who would have imagined a, a, a world five years ago where it was acceptable for brands to be roasting each other on Twitter and to be making like jokes that are very 420, 69, like very like middle school humor on their social platforms. That seems like just five years ago when they were just getting on a Facebook, like so, so far into the future. And, and here we are in 2021 and that's the world we're living in. Here's a, here's a question for you. So as we were, cause we're expanding on Twitter as well. And we saw the same thing where we'll say something that's kind of edgy and then it'll hit. And so I started doing some polls of our audience and I found out some interesting stuff. It was like 80% of our audience is either conservative or is uh, like libertarian, like basically right wing leaning. And 20% was liberal, probably totally different from McDonald's, but for our audience specific, 65% uh, believe in God. So just like various things like that. So when I talk about now, and, and we even did vaxxed versus non-vaxxed for COVID, and actually the majority of our audience is anti-vax. <laughs> and so from doing that research now, I'm learning what the Alex Berman brand can actually talk about and not talk about. How do you 
how, how are you guys testing it with someone like McDonald's? Like, how do you know that making a 420 joke's okay, but making a vaccine joke's not okay, et cetera? And how, how do you guys kind of navigate that? Yeah, so, and, and I can't share the specific example relevant to like one particular brand, but what I will say- Yeah, I'm just saying in general, like you're, yeah, you yeah. mentioned all your clients, so. From an yeah. overall perspective, um, I would say it's a couple things. For for one, it's um, I, I I love that you were able to to do that research because a lot of the time, and, and this is a conversation I have so often, especially prior to any insights and in, in data and other things that we dive into, it's almost that we on the brand marketing side inside these brands, we almost want to define our consumer more than we want to know who our consumer actually is. If that makes sense, it's almost like. We want these people to be buying L'Oreal products. So we're going to say this is our consumer and that's who we're going to go after marketing wise. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that you're almost manipulating the, the, the consumer marketing and insights when in reality, that, that's probably not your actual end demographic. And I, th I think we see that across the board. So what I like to do is get, get rid of the idea. You know who messed this up big, big was, uh, was Pit Vipers. Did you see what happened with Pit Viper? No, no. So their entire audience of pit vipers or the majority of their audience it turned out to be conservatives, but they started posting a bunch of liberal stuff, like how pit viper stands with these people and stuff. And then the entire conservative market turned on them mm -hmm. to the point where there were people talking about even buying uh, knockoff pit vipers just on Amazon to kind of spurn the brand. Yeah. And, and, and that's a perfect example. So they, that was, that's an example of completely misreading their audience. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it's almost like leadership once our audience to be this way. So we're going to convince ourselves that it is, and then we're going to push marketing towards it. And then that marketing is going to then reflect back on it. And, it, and it's creating ultimately like a false feedback loop. So what I always say is, is we need to go out and figure out two things. Number one, we need to figure out who is our current audience base and what does that look like? And then number two, we need to figure out what is the audience base that we should be going after and is most susceptible to our brand based on the morals and values that we're aligned with. Um, and I think that, that that's a really key element because it's not picking it based on what is the demographic that is just going to be most receptive to engagement and to high, like very uh, top of funnel KPIs and metrics, because those are great. But at the end of the day, views and impressions, if it's not converting into any sort of sales transaction, what are we doing at the end of the day? So we need to understand what does that bottom of the funnel look like and who is that end demographic we should be going after? How should we be going after them? not just to appease our top of funnel KPIs, but also the ones at bottom of the funnel. So I would say it's exactly that. And that's one of the biggest misconceptions in marketing and particularly Gen Z. It's brands that think Gen Z is very one track mind. It's that, okay, you know, 70% lean left, they believe in this and they believe in this and da 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 da, da and they spend all day on TikTok and they do this. When, when you and I know that there's a, there's a, a, a decent chunk of our generation that, that is totally polar opposite to that. And then there's, you know, disparity and diversity of thought and behavior along the way. And it's no longer based on um, based on demographics of race or gender. It's far more fluid. It's no longer looking like this. It's this big morphed 3D kind of sphere of which people can can be tapped into, um, frankly, because as a as a generation, we grew up with greater spheres of influence. We, we weren't limited to the television, the radio, our parents and the local kind of organizations around us and, and how we how and who we interact with at a local level. We grew up with the entire Internet at our fingertips. So if we want to get super big into Frisbee golf, we can do that. If we want to get super into this influencer, or this creator that we really love, we can do that. So our ability to expand and develop personalities and consumer behaviors is frankly just at a larger level. So the generation itself is more spread out. And so it puts the burden on brands to not look at Gen Z as this refined little demographic in a side of a box, but actually is something that is, is wider in terms of a personality and consumer behavior set. And then we need to figure out and pinpoint what are those pockets that we should be going after exactly. That's, that was the most shocking thing for me when I was on TikTok, because I literally had never used TikTok in like two months uh, until the last two months. And I started going on there and there are like you know, like 18 year old girls talking about anti-vax shit or like, you know, like people are, are going, going hard into every nook and cranny that you could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and they're hitting there. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And that's what a, an open source discover based algorithm allows for. And that's why to me, to me, TikTok's the most fascinating platform we've ever seen 
frankly, on the basis of, of that exactly. It's that anyone can go log on to it, myself or my, you know, one of the creative directors that work with us, we're both the same age. We both work in the same industry. We're both into all the same shit, but we can go on and our feeds could be entirely different because it's going to understand our behavior at a much greater level than I think any algorithm has ever understood before. And I think that's ultimately why that platform- My has brother's really wife gets mad at him because his feed, <laughs> if his feed is too many hot girls, my wife's brother gets mad at him because he know, cause she knows. She knows all the algorithms feeding him what he's looking at. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks for watching the video. Be sure to smash that like button to encourage this type of content on YouTube. Subscribe down below if you're not already. And I'll talk to you soon. Check out all our past videos if you want more training on cold email or B2B sales. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for watching. I'm Alex Berman.